Hi, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Katiusia. I am an editor in the Physical Review Journals, and I am your host today in this journal club. Uh, this is uh, an initiative from the Physical Review Journals. Uh, let me put my slides in a little better for you. Okay, so this is a uh, our new initiative to a little bit to promote early career researchers, but also to have this space where we can have a more detailed conversation and, and, and discussion on our latest publications in our journals. Um, before we start the, the discussion today, I just want to say uh, very briefly a few words about. I'm sorry, it's not moving. Okay. Uh, a few words about our new journal. I'm pretty sure you have heard about it yet already. So this is a PRX Quantum, and this is a, an open access journal. And our, our aim is to publish outstanding research in this area of quantum information science and technologies. Uh, and one of the things that we are trying to to innovate a bit concerning the, the physical review approach is that in this journal. On the top of uh, researchers that are just physicists, we also want to welcome computer scientists on one hand and also engineers on the other hand to really represent the full spectrum of uh, the research going on in quantum information um, science and technologies right now. Uh, and so I hope you also are gonna benefit from the fact that the article publication charges, they are waived till the end of the next year. So take a look at our website. We have several uh, papers already published and also an editorial explaining in more, more detail our view for this journal. Uh, I also wanna highlight for you that we just published uh, a perspective article. This is another innovation from the journal. So we have, uh, of course, regular articles, but the perspective ones, uh, they are uh, more visionary, so really forward looking. And the idea here is that we want to, of course, share the excitement in the field, but we want also to, to show these results in a way that we can connect the different parts of the community working around those topics. And the, the key thing is that we want to, to highlight what are the challenges to achieve this bright future that we might have in mind. So what are the main problems in there? And we aim that by sharing this, this challenge, the community can then work together and eventually solve those and, and move forward. Okay, so the first one was just published um, by Ivan Deutsch, Harnessing the Power of the Second Quantum Revolution. It's an uh, exceptional uh, reading, so I really recommend you to take a look. Right, so then a few words about Zoom. I'm pretty sure you have used it a few times, but so um, the idea of this journal club is really to make it as interactive as possible. So you're going to be able to use your microphone and your camera, but with that, there is a bit of a responsibility. So I ask you that you mute yourself. You can see there where you can do that. So we are going to have about 20 minutes of a talk. And then after that, we are open to questions, but you can type your questions at any moment that you want. There is a button for chat in there where you can type, or you can just click on participants. Then you're going to see this other window on the right side where you can raise your hand. And when it's time for questions, um, please feel free to, to use your microphone and your camera. So we really want to, to know each other in this meeting. Um, so then finally, today, uh, I'm very excited to have a, a paper that was published in PRX Quantum. So thanks, uh, Ivan and, and uh, his uh, co-authors for being here. Uh, we have also, uh, I want to, to welcome also Professor uh, Elohim Becerra that's going to moderate this session. So Elohim, uh, he finished his PhD in 2009 working with atomic ensembles. And then he moved on uh, to work as a postdoc in NIST uh, with quantum measurements and non-conventional detection methods. And then in 2013, he joined the University of New Mexico where he is right now, 
uh, and he is still um, using quantum measurements, but also atom photon interfaces with the purpose of improving quantum measurements of light. So thanks a lot, Elohim, for being here. And with that, the screen is yours. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to uh, be uh, moderating this session. So um, uh, this session will be talking about uh, the work in uh, time resolving quantum uh, measurement enable energy efficient large alphabet communication. And the presenter is Ivan Burenkov. He got his PhD from the uh, Moscow State University where he was interested in quantum theory. Then later, uh, later he joined as a postdoc uh, the Experimental Quantum Optics Group from uh, the Professor Sergei Kulik and the same uh, Moscow State University where he designed and assembled their first experiment in rubidium atoms, coal atoms actually. Now Ivan is an assistant research scientist at the Joint Quantum Institute and the National Institute of Standards and Technology working with Sergei Polyakov on applied quantum measurements for faint light. His broad research interests include quantum biophotonics, quantum networking, and quantum enhanced optical communications. So it, you can uh, ask questions about the talk, just raise your hand or uh, put your question in the chat. It will be monitoring the, the questions and we'll be uh, uh, posting your questions. So it, right now, uh, Ivan will be doing the presentation for 20 minutes and then we can uh, well, there will be plenty of uh, time for discussions about your questions. With this, uh, please, Ivan, uh, you can. Good morning. Mm. Uh, thank you, Elohim, for the introduction. Uh, and uh, thanks uh, for the organizers of this uh, conference, of, of this journal club, for inviting me to present our results. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see my slides. Yes, we do now. Sorry? Can you see my slides or yeah, not? We can. Thank you. You can start. So I can start. Okay, great. Um, uh, so uh, here are my co-authors, uh, Sergey and Rabir, also here today. And welcome to my talk, uh, in which I will uh, show how to adjust the quantum measurement problem altogether uh, to maximize uh, the quantum advantage. Okay, so first I'd like to put into context what we're trying to do and we are trying to make a quantum measurement practically useful. In particular, we are trying to make quantum measurement useful for measuring quantities used for classical communication, uh, but better than any classical measurement can do. And with that simple graph, I'm trying to show only one thing. Even though we may try to measure the same optical pulses uh, used for communication, classical and quantum measurement may have very different measurement methods with very different properties. And it was shown that quantum measurement can reduce amount of energy beyond the level accessible by any classical measurement. And here in our work, we actually want to unconstrain a little bit this problem. And we will adjust the entire system, including the <clears throat> way we encode an information and the way we measure uh, the information uh, encoded in these states. And with this, we want to improve energy efficiency even further and perhaps get some other benefits, maybe by increasing amount of information encoded in a single uh, signal uh, pulse. And as I said, we are interested in classical communication. So we are going to apply our uh, quantum measurement to the internet. And the internet grows exponentially, and it is expected that it will continue to grow exponentially. But it means that we may actually start expanding resources exponentially if we don't do anything uh, to the technology behind the internet. And the real things that are happening when you watch these digital presentations, those real things are some physical signals that need to be transmitted back and forth 
And typically, for long distance communications, those are optical states. And there are minimal energy per bit of information that need to be transmitted in order to get a reliable communication between uh, point A and B. And another very important resource is bandwidth. And you can basically touch it because those are fibers. So both of these resources uh, is necessary for communication. And basically, we expect exponentially growing demand for these resources, which is not good. So one possible way to slow things down is to try to change the technology and substitute the classical measurement with quantum measurement. Uh, but let's take a look on what's going on today. Right now, as you watch this presentation, somebody probably measures phases on your behalf because communication requires measurement. And it turns out that uh, it's easy to measure phase in optics. Therefore, it's not a big surprise that many communication protocols are based on the phase measurement. And this <coughs> measurement is somehow matched to the communication protocol. And the protocol is made to, for the particular measurement. And if we just break that loop and basically put a quantum measurement here, but keep the same protocol, and this is precisely what was done before by many groups, and it actually helps. But then you broke this circle of influence in the protocol by the measurement and measurement by the protocol. <clears throat> uh, and it is not necessar necessarily that the measurement of the phases is going to be better or best for the quantum measurement. So uh, here we want to come up with a new protocol that is taking into account all these properties of the quantum measurement which may get you not only better energy sensitivity, but also can give you some other pretty nice things. And the only thing you need to do is you need to include these quantum properties, both into your measurement system and into your communication protocol and gain some extra benefits. So as I said, there are two resources of the communication channel, uh, the energy and the bandwidth. And, uh, for the energy, you want to use as low of energy as possible or spend less photons per bit of information. So you want to be on the left side of this graph. And for the bandwidth, you want to have a maximal information rate uh, without using much of the bandwidth. So you want to be on top of this graph. So a super protocol, we use no energy and will have high information rate without using, without using bandwidth. But you cannot have both. Physics tell us that we can, cannot infinitely improve bandwidth and energy efficiency at the same time. So there is a fundamental limit for improvement of energy and bandwidth resources of a communication channel known as a Hollywood bound. <clears throat> I'm sorry. So what you can do if you just use a quantum measurement with a, a classical modulation protocol, well, you can actually shift the boundaries of energy efficiency, which is good, uh, but that's it, nothing else. And we return to the question, can we get any extra benefit if we use communication protocol matching the quantum measurement? And as you can see, with our new protocol, we are getting closer to this turning point of the <coughs> channel capacity limit, but we are still doing it in a practical way. Uh, the only thing that changed here is a communication protocol or the way in how we modulate our optical signals. And now uh, we try to match our modulation to the quantum measurement. And uh, know that in contrast to legacy protocol, it allows us uh, to optimize both energy efficiency and bandwidth efficiency. While legacy protocols allow expansion of one of the resources, but it's significant increase of cost of the other resource. Our protocol works um, with uh, any communication media and it's fully compatible uh, with uh, existing uh, fiber network. And what is often our look is that network for classical communication using such uh, low signal power allowed by the quantum receivers would naturally exist in the same fiber with the quantum network channels. 
And now you can <clears throat> pick one or two of the advantages provided by the quantum receiver. You can, uh, but you cannot have them all. You can choose to make an amplification-free channel between DC and New York, for example, or you can reduce significantly input signal power for shorter links. And you decide how you spend your quantum advantage and improve the resource efficiency. And how you do that? Let me start with the introduction of our quantum-inspired protocol. So the coherent frequency shift keying protocol uses an alphabet of M coherent pulses of duration T. Each symbol uh, of the communication alphabet is a coherent state, uh, which is uh, detuned from the adjacent symbols and have initial phase shift relative to the other symbols. And there are two parameters that we can use to match our protocol to the quantum measurement. The detuning normalized on the pulse duration and this initial phase shift. So with our quantum measurement, we want to distinguish letters in our, from, the, uh, from this alphabet. In this example, there is four states uh, shown with these different colors. Uh, so consider an uh, optical pulse, signal pulse. At the receiver, you need to decide which alphabet letter is this pulse. And we need to do it in a practical way. Since we don't have a quantum computer yet, uh, then to do that, all we need is to come up with some practical approach. And here we use the local oscillator, <clears throat> which will cancel the signal. So our detector will get nothing. And this is actually how you get the quantum measurement to work. You get nothing. That means that you actually receive the signal. If you made a mistake and your local oscillator in the wrong state and doesn't match the signal pass, then photons can be detected. And then the trick is really in the feedback to the local oscillator. So for the feedback, what we do differently from other quantum receivers is we take advantage of the fact that single photon detector actually produces accurate timestamps for every detected photon. So you get a single photon detection clicks over here, and these times can be actually used for the feedback in a better way than it was done before. And you can use these photon arrival times to switch your local oscillator as quick as possible to the right state because your signal contains just a few photons. <clears throat> Interestingly, the simplest but fast feedback prompting input signal uh, sequentially switching to the next letter in the alphabet after each click uh, can bring you beyond the classical limit. Uh, and we have measured it experimentally and showed this quantum advantage for both phase shift keying and coherent frequency shift keying protocols. And uh, this was published about two weeks ago in OSA Continuum. However, here we're interested in optimal feedback using both properties of the encoding and the time resolved in measurement. Uh, so we use accurate timestamp with Bayesian inference at the receiver. So the receiver arrived to the right local oscillator as soon as possible, because we, we are very limited in energy or basically in number of photons in our signal pulse. So let me reiterate it step by step. If the local oscillator matches the signal, then it will cancel the input signal and no photons will be detected. And if local oscillator is in wrong state, then there is a probability to receive a photon, and this probability depends on time. And for different combination of local oscillators and signal states, <clears throat> this probability is very different. And every time receiver detects a photon, it uses Bayesian inference to switch local oscillator to the most probable state. And this different dependence of the photon arrival probabilities for different combinations of local oscillators and signal allows us to extract more information about signal state and arrive to the right local oscillator faster. So then the history of all the detection and uh, all the local oscillators which were used is basically used to make a final decision and discrimination decision. However, it can happen that by the end of the signal, 
the receiver didn't arrive into the right uh, local oscillator state. <clears throat> then we register an error in state discrimination. And we try to adjust, so we adjust the detunings and the phase shift between the alphabet states of our communication uh, protocol uh, to switch the local oscillator to the right state as soon as possible and therefore minimize number of errors. I've prepared a few additional slides with some technical details on protocol optimization and on how the receiver works and implemented. So please feel free to ask uh, me a question if you want me to go deeper into these details. Uh, so the receiver consists of the local oscillator and uh, an balanced fiber beam splitter with splitting ratio 99 to 1. The single photon detector is placed at the uh, output of the channel, which is almost transparent for the signal. So it's 99% transparent for the signal. And uh, then uh, the detector signals timestamp with the FPGA. FPGA is a field programmable gate array, which is basically the brain of our receiver. It is responsible for the timestamps, for feedback, uh, for the local oscillator, and finally for making discrimination decision. <clears throat> and the total uh, experimental uh, communication test bed includes two almost identical blocks, uh, which we use to prepare our signal pulses and our local oscillator. And we also have a standalone uh, interferometric stabilization system uh, for the setup. Uh, but this uh, system is uh, quite versatile because we can change the program in FPGA and basically this entire test bed becomes a receiver for a different communication protocol. And what is important uh, here is the system efficiency uh, because we want to compare uh, performance of our receiver with a classical receiver having 100% system efficiency. So to, to characterize performance of our uh, encoding protocol on the receiver, we measure the probability of error, or also known as symbol error rate, versus the input energy of the uh, signal. So uh, we measure it in photons per bit, so we can compare uh, protocols using different number of symbols. And the experimental results is shown with green dots, and ideal classical limit shown with red dots and red solid line. Uh, red dashed curve shows the classical limit adjusted for uh, efficiency for system efficiency of our experimental setup. And uh, black solid line correspond to the fundamental quantum limit or Hurston bound. We also put uh, quantum limit and uh, classical limit for legacy phase shift king protocol using the same number of uh, states in communication alphabet. This uh, example is for eight states. And as you can see, uh, our receiver uh, performs below the ideal classical limit. And it also performs below the fundamental quantum limit for legacy phase shift in protocol using the same uh, amount, number of uh, symbols. Uh, so that means that even in theory, there is no receiver for phase shift keying with eight symbols that cannot perform our experimental receiver. On the right graph, uh, you can see relative advantage of uh, our experimental setup in comparison to ideal classical limit in logarithmic scale. So to compare <coughs> uh, different protocols, uh, let's uh, plot the symbol errors or probability of errors of these different receivers for a fixed energy of one photon per bit, but for different alphabet lengths. And before our work, uh, the, uh, before this work, quantum receivers with communication protocols with the longest alphabet of four states were demonstrated. Uh, so the purple dot is uh, uh, result for pulse position modulation uh, paired with conditional pulse nulling receiver. Uh, this work was done in 2012. And uh, the blue star is uh, for uh, phase shift keying. 
using also four uh, coherent states with four different phases and multi-stage receiver with photon number resolved uh, measurement. And the green dots gain our experimental results. And as you can see for the same alphabet lens of just four symbols, uh, we have almost twice uh, lower symbol error rate in comparison to previous work with phase shift keying. And if we make a longer alphabet and see, for example, trying to distinguish 16 coherent states, uh, we have uh, the symbol error rate, which is comparable to the result with uh, four phase four phase shift keying uh, protocol. But if we use 16 states and each symbol carries twice more information. And with this, I'd like to conclude. So in our work, we identified information available in quantum measurement, but not accessible by classical means. And this information is photon arrival time. So we found a way to harness this additional knowledge about quantum state. And the result is the first experimental demonstration of holistic quantum enabled communication scheme with the record energy efficiency. We report the lowest error rate and discrimination of multiple optical states here in energy corresponding to just one photon per bit of transmitted information. And we demonstrate discrimination of large number of optical states uh, beyond classical limits, showing scalability of quantum merit enabled communication for the first time. Uh, and with this, uh, I'd like to invite you to ask questions and start. Uh, the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ivan. So we have a couple of questions already. Um, the first one is from Federico Centrone. How do you compute the required energy in the classical and quantum cases? Isn't the intensity of the pulses when they are produced or when they are measured? So this, I believe this uh, relates to the, your uh, experimental setup and also is a theoretical question. How do you calculate the energy efficiency? Okay. Uh, how do you compute the required energy in the classical and quantum clay cases? Okay, so for a classical case, we calculate uh, the probability of error in discrimination of the states uh, using the so-called short noise limit. And uh, for this, we need to, so in our case, we simulate the optimal classical receiver and we do it numerically. So that's why we have these uh, red dots on the curve. Uh, for legacy communication protocols like PSK, there is known uh, theoretical limits which are can calculate it in integral form. So we used uh, basically uh, these formulas to calculate uh, the short noise limit for, for legacy protocols. And uh, in our case, uh, we basically make an experiment and we measure uh, how many errors we get in discrimination of the states for different uh, input uh, energy in the signal. Uh, did I answer the question? Maybe my characters won't add something. I don't know. Federico, uh, does that answer your question? You can use your mic if you like. Okay. okay. Yes, he responded yes. So the uh, next question is from Matt Enger. So Matt, you can uh, unmute yourself and then put your video if you would like to, and you can uh, ask your qu the question by yourself. And there will be uh, a better uh, going back and forth between questions and answers. Okay, I guess it's here, slide 39. Right. Uh, why do you want to use a, a larger alphabet, right? Right. Um, I, <laughs> it's my own ignorance, but maybe that would help to put this into perspective a little bit. Uh, so as you increase the alphabet lens, you increase the amount of information which you encode with each symbol, basically. And uh, it's because the, the number of uh, bits encoded in the symbol is basically logarithm of number of your alphabet lengths. 
Okay. However, it's always, yeah, there is always a trade-off. It's always come at some cost. But as you can see here, as I mentioned at the last slide, when we use 16 symbols uh, for communication, we have symbol error rate, which is comparable to a previous result, but we have twice more bits of information with, carried with each symbol. And uh, if you look on the quantum limit, we, we are not close to quantum limit, it's true, but you can see that it's actually go down for longer alphabets here, the black line. So if, if you do better than we did, then you can, pro you can also improve the uh, energy efficiency for long alphabets. Okay, thanks, that's, that's fine. You, uh, anyone can pose uh, more questions as uh, they come. So um, I think at this point, I don't see more questions right now. Um, okay, so uh, right here, so the difference in prob probability of error. Uh, oh, uh, uh, Federico has another question, but let me just ask right now here. The difference in probability of error of QPSK, which is the phase encoding only, and uh, your scheme that combines phase and energy, can I understand that? by uh, thinking about non-orthogonality in the sense that these four states are, their uh, overlap is much lower than the QPSK states? Uh, so uh, maybe to help, uh, this can help me to answer your question for some reason. Okay. Uh, so here you can see uh, both bandwidth expansion and the energy efficiency. And uh, this is true that uh, we use uh, frequency detunings. So we expand, we, we expand in bandwidth. So we use some more, we use more bandwidth than the phase shift key. Uh, but uh, we do not use very large detunings. So we don't use orthogonal states they're still non-orthogonal uh, because our uh, detuning is like, if you normalize it on the pulse duration, delta omega t. So to make a state orthogonal, it should be two pi. And uh, this, this, so the results here uh, obtained for detuning of pi, which is twice smaller in comparison to orthogonal. This is actually the classical uh, performance of the orthogonal frequency shift keying. And uh, this plot is for pi over three. And uh, we have measured, uh, uh, we have measured uh, performance for pi over two, but it, it's, it's not published in, in this paper. So we can squeeze, we can really squeeze the bandwidth use with quantum measurement. So we don't need to use orthogonal modulation like uh, uh, Pulse position modulation. Uh, let me show another picture. Uh, so here you can see the optimization map for the receiver. And here the this X is uh, initial phase shift and this X is detuning. And basically zero detuning corresponds to the phase shift key. And uh, we work approximately here, but we also have measurement here in this uh, deep. And in theory, you can go even closer somewhere here, still get an advantage in comparison to phase shift keying. And uh, the, as you understand, as I, as I, yeah, as I explained, uh, these oscillations in probability to get photons, that's what help you with time resolving receiver, because for phase shift keying, you have uh, constant probabilities. And uh, moreover, for, in, for, for QPSK, two of them are the same. Did, did I answer your question? Yes, thank you. Uh, so can I add a little bit to that? This is Sergey Polikov. 
Uh, so, hi, Lahim. Uh, thank you for your question. Ivan, can you go back and show the graph that is uh, uh, that has a Hollywood bound? Uh, just to make a point here. Um, so yeah, so arguably, and again, this really is uh, up to uh, the task that you have, the practical task that you have. But if you uh, come up with a combined resource use, which would be uh, the lowest energy and the lowest band at the same time, uh, it turns out that all the protocols are actually exponentially getting worse with the, with the length of the alphabet. But here, really, if you wanted to utilize both the most efficiently, then you want to be as close to the uh, turning point of the Hollywood curve as possible. And as you can tell from this graph here, the green curve gets job a little bit better than other legacy protocols. So in that sense, the combined resource use gets uh, optimized. And uh, uh, now about, about this slide, so, but it, since you are using, so this, the, the, the limit for this, this protocol, the, this protocol that combines phase and, and frequency will be still the uh, channel limit, right? Uh, well. Because you do not, because you are using symbol by symbol detection. Well, I, well, classical, Classically, yes, you're using uh, you're using interferometry, and I guess because you're using a classical interferometer, then you know because of its short noise, you're bounded by channel limit in that sense. And uh, it's not the case for the orthogonal protocol, obviously, because uh, in that case, it's uh, uh, you're using bandwidth different. You're it's, it's it's just a different protocol and a different type of calculation. Um, but again, if you're using a quantum measurement, then you probably can actually surpass that channel limit because channel limit is a limit for a very particular classical measurement. Okay, thank you, Sergey. So, um, if Federico Centrone has another question. Federico, would you like to uh, unmute yourself and then show the uh, your camera, if you would like, if you wish? Uh, actually, I think I was answered, but I still may ask a question. Um, the advantage here actually comes from the fact that you use single photon detectors rather than homodyne detection. Uh, is there like some trade-off in using these two types of measurement for uh, Gaussian states? I'm not sure. Okay, so um... oh, sorry, I ran wrong way. So basically, uh, uh, we use Gaussian states because this is coherent state, right? And uh, with a classical receiver, you definitely cannot get uh, photon arrival times. Uh, but uh, I think the quantum, so the advantage beyond the short noise limit basically comes from the way you do it. So you try to cancel your signal. And when you cancel your signal, you basically measure vacuum and vacuum doesn't have a short noise. So you want to arrive to the right local oscillator as soon as possible so you cancel your signal completely and then you get rid of the short noise and get below the short noise limit. But if I may add a few words again, uh, Federico. So uh, yes, you need to use a, a, a good detector for this, because one of the practical trade-offs would be uh, the basically dark count rate. And once you get a dark count, you get this scheme thrown out, because uh, every dark count is, uh, is considered to be a real count. You can't really tell which one is which. So you need to 
get a good detector and uh, maybe even optimize this protocol. You can optimize this protocol to be, uh, well, more tolerant. You can't completely negate it, but you can optimize it to be a little bit more tolerant to those sporadic errors. Okay, thanks. I guess also the, the jitter and like the, the, the inaccuracy of the time arrivals might influence the, the correctness of the protocol. Uh, well, sure. in this case, oh, sorry, sorry, Ivan, you want to go? Go. Yeah, so in, in our case, the uh, time in Jitter was, uh, we, can, we can neglect it because uh, we use resolute pulses for communication. But uh, yeah, the, the slowest part of our experimental setup is basically our, uh, uh, so our preparation modules are based on acousto optical modulators. And this was the slowest part of the setup, but it allowed us to make uh, the, this experimental test bed very uh, versatile because we can basically switch our switch it to uh, very, very, very various uh, communication protocols. But the switching time is about one microsecond for the uh, uh, acoustical modulator and uh, time and jitter for the receiver for the single photon detector can be way below one nanosecond. Okay, thanks. Sorry, just one last question that I leave you alone. Sure. Um, okay, well, why do you need like uh, can can you use equivalently like a, a phase shift, like a phase modulator instead of a, a frequency modulator for uh, for doing the same thing basically? Uh, yes, you can. Uh, you can do serodyning with uh, phase modulators. Uh, it's uh, just uh, happened that we are good uh, in, so we, we had uh, plenty of acoustic optical modulators and uh, for serodynin, we never did it and we worked a lot with acoustic optical modulators. So it was for, for versatility and uh, 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 basically we can uh, set up, like we build this setup within a half year and uh, yeah, I guess most time we spent on uh, basically FPGA part. <laughs> and uh, yeah, you can do, you can, this is actually the, the way to significantly, significantly increase the feedback bandwidth for our setup. Because right now, because of this one microsecond, it's basically less than one megahertz. And you, with phase modulators, you can go beyond gigahertz. Thanks a lot. Okay, um, Stojan, so uh, would you like to ask a question yourself? Stojan, so grab it. Yeah. I do understand that the coherent states are uh, the best ones for the from the practical uh, implementation of, of these protocols because you can transmit it to longer distances and you can easily manipulate them. But I was just uh, wondering whether the use of any other quantum states such as squeeze states uh, in this type of setup may improve efficiency or eventually lead closer towards ho uh, achieving whole level limit. And if so, what would be other problems with encoding larger alphabets in the squeeze states? Or, or any other type of quantum states that we may want to use? Uh, so um, regarding the other states, uh, you can, in theory, you can reach the whole of a bound of, it, actually the original work where it is suggested it's uh, Gordon work where it's called Gordon bound. If you use uh, basically alphabet of Fox states, if you use alphabet of Fox states, you can uh, reach the whole of a bound right away. But the problem is, it requires lossless channel. If you have losses in your channel, your fog biases uh, degrades very quickly and you cannot distinguish fog states if they're in a lossy channel that easy. Uh, for squeeze states, there are a few works uh, uh, trying to uh, uh, 
show advantage with the squeeze states. But again, uh, unfortunately, squeeze states are very fragile and therefore they are very susceptible to loss. Our loss basically kill, kills squeezing in your state and uh, then you lose the advantage. From this point of view, yeah, coherent state is uh, the most, uh, uh, the, the, easiest, the easiest states to use because loss basically attenuates the amplitude, but even if you use amplitude modulation, it attenuates all the amplitudes uh, linearly like with, the re with respect to, to each other. So you keep the ratio and amplitudes and it doesn't affect phase and frequency of your state. So that, that, that's why the coherent states are states of uh, choice. Uh, but I think, uh, this is Sergey again, uh, Stoyan is right. In some cases, you may want to use uh, states like uh, squeeze states, particularly in a very short form communication, like in a data bank. If you, if you have to communicate uh, between the two sites that are one meter apart and you want to do it fast, and those data banks, by the way, generate a lot of heat, speaking of, uh, you know, the green things around us. So reducing the power by doing things, you know, in a clever way, in a more clever way, actually would help. And I think there was a, a publication or two which explored using quantum-like receivers, displacement receivers, for at least two of those states. And uh, in fact, I think there is no problem to encode more or two. Um, whether it not, or not is going to be done by somebody, we'll see. But definitely that's a correct line of thought, I would say. Thank you. Okay, let me ask a question. So uh, to achieve, to surpass the, the channel limit, you need, uh, and, and try to achieve the whole level bound, you need some uh, measurements that perform uh, some computations on jo some jo joint measurements in uh, multiple states of your alphabet. Have you considered that? Take your measurement to have some joint detection receivers? uh yeah we consider it but we 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 didn't measure uh the like we didn't implement uh the code words and code word measurements uh so far yeah we are thinking about uh using some code words and maybe forward order correction and try to see how where we can get uh on this graph and Basically, this is the reason I don't put experimental points on this graph because we didn't make any uh, measurement in this direction. I don't see any more questions. Do you? Anyone would like? I would like you to. I would like to encourage you to uh, ask questions now. That's a good time. Or if the authors wants to want to add something, right now. Okay. Perhaps I. Sorry, as as a host, I cannot raise hands. I don't have the button, so I have to jump <laughs> in. I'm sorry. Uh, Perhaps would you like to tell us a little bit uh, in which direction this work is going for the future? What are the, the new other things that you want to investigate more in there? Uh, so uh, there is a few things we are looking forward. So we are building the setup. So this measurement is done in a visible range and we are building setup at telecom, so at 1550. So we can uh, actually try things in a, a small scale network uh, at NIST, uh, at a real telecommunication band. And we also working on a, a hybrid protocols, uh, uh, which uh, actually uses both phase and frequency for encoding of information. And this way you can further push uh, the bandwidth efficiency of the channel, uh, because you can, uh, let's say, you can use eight alphabet of eight states to encode information, but only two frequencies. 
So uh, then your expansion and bandwidth will be quite small because you only use only two frequencies. But each frequency will care, for example, four phase states. And uh, this way you can significantly uh, increase the amount of information encoded in each symbol without expanding bandwidth too much. Uh, also, yeah, we look uh, uh, maybe in some uh, applications for uh, an ambiguous state discrimination with this uh, protocol uh, where we can use actually the uh, uh, measured uh, like measured Bayesian probabilities to uh, make an ambiguous discrimination of the states. Uh, maybe Sergey has some other plans he want to share, I don't know. Well, I think uh, you covered most of it. Uh, well, we also have a, a plan to uh, basically make a circuit as integrated as possible. And there is a program at uh, the University of Maryland that uh, would actually make the receiver on a chip. Well, right now, the detector is not going to be on the chip. But in principle, you might think about putting also a detector, such as superconducting nanowire, directly on the chip. Well, for this stage right now, we're not going to do that, but uh, uh, well, it will compactify things, hopefully, and uh, uh, well, that would open this idea for, uh, well, actually, uh, uh, truly using it, because in the end, you need many of these receivers in a single channel so that you can share the resources. You need to multiplex, and to multiplex, you need to simplify, and so that, yeah, there is a, uh, there is a work going in that direction. Okay, thank you. So there is another uh, question, a technical question from Akio Hijioki, mm -hmm. coming from some of uh, outside of the field. I wonder about the efficiency in terms of energy and speed of the implementation of the Bayesian update, uh, updating, decision updating uh, uh, using the FPGA. Uh, I'm not sure about energy part, but uh, for the speed, I can tell that the longest decision for 16 states take less than 15 nanoseconds. And uh, we didn't spend much time optimizing this part of PJ code because our acoustic optical modulators take uh, one microsecond and uh, reducing 15 nanoseconds to, let's say, 20 or 10 uh, won't help much to the setup. But yeah, the number right now is less than 50, 50 nanoseconds for 16 states. And this is because you are not doing real time uh, uh, calculations inside the FPGA, but instead you are doing something different, right? Uh, so we do part of the calculations. Uh, so, so this is basically what we need all together to make decision and this is quite complicated because there is the integrals and the exponents we, and even cosine functions, which is not so quick uh, on the FPGA. Uh, so we use uh, pre-computed maps of these uh, values. And all we calculate is basically is this part. So we update the uh, Bayesian uh, rule probability, which is uh, basically uh, multiplication of the prior on the likelihood. And uh, here you can see how the maps look like. And they are pre-computed and uploaded to the lookup table. But, they, but the idea here is that you multiply that by your current state of the uh, of Bayesian probabilities. And that multiplication actually doesn't take that much time if you are using yeah. uh, modern FPG. So this number that you see right here, you need to multiply it by the priors. And this prior is what you are updating in real time in the FPGA? Uh, the uh, priors are updated in real time in the FPGA. Yeah. Those are lookup look tables. 
Yeah, so this number, which is likelihood, is encoded in a memory on the FPGA, and the real time calculation is for the uh, so you for updating your priors basically. So you have your uh, prior Bayesian uh, probability, you multiply it on the likelihood which you get from the lookup table, and you get your a posteriori probability. And you do it, we do it real time on FPJ. Also, you, you find the largest, uh, basically largest uh, Bayesian probability real time. So you do comparison between these probabilities on FPJ to find the largest one. And then you make your decision. Uh, so for your feedback, uh, of the local oscillator. So you pick the largest probability. And this you do real time. And Ivan, you, you mentioned that you are doing uh, the optimization of this uh, strategy. Uh, what mm -hmm. are the physical parameters that you are optimizing? Uh, oh, um, so uh, basically this likelihood uh, you can, uh, so this is an ideal, uh, ideal uh, photon probability. And you can insert uh, visibility in the model, and you can insert dark uh, counts in the model. And this will uh, change your, uh, basically, your lookup table. Also, uh, also you, uh, oh, you mean, um, okay. Probably uh, uh, another thing to mention is that you can actually include in this model that your local oscillator can be unbalanced, so it can be brighter than your signal. And uh, this is optim this is what's called optimal displacement receiver, I guess. So you can, uh, for low input powers, you can get lower error rates if you use local oscillator, which is brighter than uh, your signal. So it will not displace it exactly to the vacuum, but it will displace uh, states uh, a little bit further than vacuum. And it will enhance the probability to detect the error if you're in the wrong state, but the tr at the cost of uh, a little bit increasing probability to get photon if you are in the right state. But it still help you uh, to uh, get uh, a little bit better uh, performance here, where you have a very low number of photons. I guess it's uh, uh, you have a similar work uh, where you use uh, local oscillator with uh, optimized displacement. And my other question is, is about optimality. So <clears throat> in this uh, graph, you are showing the, uh, the experimental results. Mm -hmm. you, are, you, are, you are showing the, the Hellstrom bound for this, part, this kind of modulation. So do you, know, do you know how to approach this Hellstrom bound? <laughs> it's about optimality and, and suboptimality. So is your... Uh, uh, measurement optimal this this answer my this question might be not trivial but uh, the next question is how how close does your uh, measurement get to the to the hellstrom bound uh, i don't know how to get closer uh, so i have some ideas and we we actually have a quite strong simplification of uh, the optimization parameters. Uh, so formally, uh, each of the state can has its own detuning, and it can has its own initial phase. So for M states, you will end up with two M parameters, not with not with just two. And uh, if you use two M optimization parameters, you may get closer to the Hellstrom bound, but uh, the simulation of uh, this problem is really 
uh, exhaustion and calculation resources. So we, so I uh, end up using just two parameters, and then I can uh, get these optimization maps where we have just two parameters. And yeah, using m for m equal eight, using sixteen parameters for optimization, uh, it will take quite a by, quite a lot of time to uh, optimize the system, but. Um, other than that, uh, I, I, I don't really know how to uh, well, And yeah, we also tried this uh, optimal displacement and uh, optimizing the strategy to include uh, ex experimental uh, uh, deficiencies. Uh, but to make the receiver optimal, no, we don't know the way how to make the receiver optimal. Uh, except uh, if we had a quantum computer, uh, there is some ideas how to get to Hellstrom with quantum computer, but unfortunately we don't have one. So in a way you can think about this work as trying to get as much as possible from a practical uh, type of the receiver, the displacement type of the receiver and uh, uh, basically see what it can do at its maximum. Uh, but you're absolutely right, there may be other receivers, but the best of all obviously would be a quantum computer. Thank you. Um, Katizia, would you like to say some words? Okay, so we approached one hour of the meeting. So I'd like to thank so much for Ivan, Sergey, and Elohim for this uh, nice discussion. And also thanks for all the participants for, for being here and for the questions. Uh, please take a look in the web, uh, the website of the Journal Club. So we aim to have about more or less one meeting per month. So I hope to see you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.